I invite you to take your Bible and turn with me to the book of Galatians, Galatians chapter 2. What a blessing it's been to worship the Lord through song this morning and to witness the baptisms, the test, public testimony of what God has done in the lives of four people. Amen? Amen. What a blessing. The title of the series we're in is titled, The Gospel is Enough. And that is the title for our study through the book of Galatians, a six-chapter book. We're now in chapter two, and the message titled today is Fighting for the Gospel. Fighting for the Gospel. In the beginning of chapter two, the apostle Paul uh, testifies to the Galatian churches about his trip to Jerusalem. The first trip to Jerusalem was three years after his conversion. Then there was an interval for a long period of time, 14 years in fact, and then in verses 1 through 10 of chapter 2, he records what it was like on his second trip to Jerusalem after becoming a Christian, which was 17 years after he became a Christian. And there he argued the truth of the gospel, that we are not to add to the gospel, that one does not have to become a Jew before becoming a Christian. There were Jews that had left Jerusalem that had gone to Antioch and then to the Galatian region and spread throughout those churches that yes, you had to become a Christian. You had to place your faith in Jesus, but in addition to that, you had to become a Jew. You had to follow the the Jewish diet. The men had to be circumcised. All of these things, Gentiles had to become Jews in order to become Christians, and that is nonsense. And so Paul and Barnabas and Titus made their way up to Jerusalem, arguing the truth of the gospel that Jesus and his death, burial, and resurrection and faith in him as the resurrected Lord is sufficient for salvation. James, Peter, who's referred to as Cephas, and John, all three pillars of the Jerusalem church, leaders in the first church, the Jerusalem church, all three agreed with the apostle Paul in the first 10 verses. Now we continue the story with verse 11. You're going to find that the location changes. Time has now passed, years we believe, and Peter, who's referred to as Cephas, makes his way to Antioch where Paul is located at that time. If you'll please stand with me for the reading of God's perfect word. I'll be reading verses 11 through 18 this morning. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For prior to the coming of certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles, but when they came, he began to withdraw and and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision. The rest of the Jews joined in hypocrisy, with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in the presence of all, If you, being a Jew, live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? We are Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Since by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. But if while seeking to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have also been found sinners, is Christ then a minister of sin? May it never be. For I, if I rebuild what I have once destroyed, I prove myself to be a transgressor. This is the word of the living God. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for the reading of your word that has power to pierce the depths of our hearts and souls. Lord God, I pray that you would take the truth of these verses I just read, and I pray that you would show each and every person that's under the sound of my voice, whether at home or in this room, of how great you are and that no one can possibly be right with you by doing good stuff 
but they can only be right by you if they'll submit themselves to you, that they'll confess you as the Lord over their lives and believe that you rose from the dead on the third day, Lord Jesus. And so I pray, Lord God, you would take this text of Scripture and teach truth today. And I pray you would draw the lost unto yourself and save them. And I pray that you would stir the saved to be uncompromising about the true gospel. Give us boldness, Lord God, to tell others of the powerful gospel of you. We pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. As I stated a moment ago, in verses 1 through 10, we found that James, Peter, and John gave the right hand of fellowship to Paul, saying, yes, we agree with you. You are preaching the true gospel, that you don't have to add any Jewish stuff to it. Simply, faith in Jesus Christ is the way of salvation. And so now they're all united, but now some time has passed and some, we believe some years have passed, and now Cephas is going to come to Paul, and we find out that he has not kept with the declaration he made that day in Jerusalem. So number one, the consequence of compromise by spiritual leaders. When spiritual leaders, church leaders, compromise the true gospel, the consequences are great. It impacts many, many people. And we're going to see that some of the leaders failed the Lord here in these verses. Verse 11 and following, but when Cephas, that's Peter, came to Antioch, Paul says, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. He was in the wrong. For prior to the coming of certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles, but when they came, he withdrew But excuse me, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision. The party of the circumcision are those Jews that came from Jerusalem under James's leadership. They came up to the Galatian region, which is on the north side of the Mediterranean Sea, modern day Turkey. And in that region, they began to spread. Yes, we know you believed in Jesus, but you got to do more than that. You got to believe in Jesus and you got to become a Jew. And Peter began to fear them rather than lead them. He began to fear them rather than reject their message. Now, who is James? James, we believe, is the half-brother of the Lord Jesus, who after Jesus rose from the dead, he became a devoted follower of the Lord Jesus and the leader of the church in Jerusalem. But in Jerusalem, the church consists of Jews. And now out throughout the region, like the Galatian region, many Gentiles live there. So the church is there with the majority of them were Gentiles in those churches. And so do they have to become Jews to be saved? That is the debate. And Paul's already gone to Jerusalem on two occasions testifying that the gospel is through faith in Jesus alone. He thought that settled it, but it hasn't. Because why? When we proclaim the truth gospel, the devil will always try to lead people to come up with a counterfeit gospel. He doesn't stop. We can get together and have a, a council meet, and they can all say that faith in Jesus alone saves. But that doesn't mean that the devil's going sit to sit down, take a break, and not try to lead people astray. And that's what happened here. He, the devil went to work after that council. And so now Peter, who was eating with Gentiles, having meals with them and, and eating pork most likely. Jews don't eat pork, but he was eating pork with those Gentiles is my understanding. But when the Jews showed up and said, no, you're not supposed to do that, he, sp- he separated himself from the Jews, basically saying, I can't eat with you anymore, sorry. He was a hypocrite. And so Paul is calling him out on it. Let me remind you of what Peter agreed to back in verse 9 of chapter 2. Recognizing the grace that had been given to me, Paul writes, James and Cephas, that's Peter, and John, who were reputed to be pillars, gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. Peter had already said, faith in Christ alone saves. You don't have to add to it. You don't have to become a Jew to be saved and receive the Holy Spirit of God. Now he's in the Galatian, he's going up to the Galatian region. He's going up to Antioch, actually, east of it. And Paul's testifying about it. And when he gets to Antioch, 
Paul rebukes Peter because Peter has compromised the very declaration he has already made. Please hear me. Peter is trying to appear faithful. He's in church every week. If you say, how, how is one saved? You'd say by repentance of sin and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But then when someone comes around and says, no, no, you got to become a Jew too. He'd say, yeah, yeah, that too. He's trying to ride the fence. He's trying to be a people pleaser. And that doesn't work with the gospel. You and I don't have a right to say what the gospel is. The gospel is what God says it is. We don't have a right to alter it. And so Peter was led into hypocrisy. Why? The fear of man. Proverbs 29, 25 says the fear of man brings a snare. And that's exactly what happened to Peter. He feared the party of the circumcision rather than correcting them. He gave in to them. And here he is, a leader of the church. Now, let me remind you of Peter. Peter's the, the disciple that traveled with Jesus for three years. Peter is the one that had in Acts, earlier in the book of Acts, we learned that he went to Cornelius' home, a Gentile man, and led Cornelius and his household to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He had seen Gentiles become Christians without becoming Jews. And then according to this text, he has been eating meals with Gentiles that placed their faith in Jesus that had not become Jews, but now he is distancing himself from them because some others come in and add to the gospel. What do we learn from this? Please get these two truths. What you claim is truth today, you will compromise tomorrow if it doesn't go past your head to the depth of your soul. I'm going to say that again. You proclaim you, you believe something today, but if you don't let it sink deep within you, you will compromise it tomorrow. What you claim today will change if you don't ingrain that truth in the depth of your soul. Second, you can declare a truth among those that agree with you. But if you won't declare the same truth among those that don't agree with you, you are a hypocrite. I say that strongly, but I say it compassionately. I can understand how people can be tempted, but that doesn't justify the sin. If in this setting you'll say Jesus is the only way of salvation, but if you won't go into the workplace and say the same thing, because those there don't agree with you, then you are exactly like Peter. You are a hypocrite. That's what it's teaching here. And that's why Paul rebukes him. As soon as he gets from Jerusalem to Antioch, Paul lets him have it in front of everybody. This isn't private, this is public. You know, many say today, you know, I want to follow the example of the Apostle Paul, but I don't really hear people say I want to follow the example of the Apostle Peter. And I believe this text is the primary reason why. Peter compromised the gospel, and Paul called him out on it. And when in, in compromising the gospel, you know what you do? You don't make peace with everybody. You lead people astray. When you or I add to the gospel, we lead people astray astray. We harm them rather than help them. When they say, wait a second, you believe Jesus is the only way to heaven? You're telling me those that are faithful to another religion that are sincere about their God, they can't end up in heaven because it's not through Jesus? And you say, well, you're a hypocrite and you're causing harm. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. The answer, simple answer is that is yes. Jesus has told us he is the way, not a way. He is the truth, not a truth. He is the one that gives spiritual life. No one else can do that. He is the only way to God the Father in heaven. That is true in this setting. It is also true when you have 10 rifles aimed at you by those who hate Christians. It is the truth whether you deny it or not. 
Now, what's sad about this text is not only did Peter compromise, but Barnabas compromised. So sad. Barnabas is the one that when Paul was saved and he wanted to preach, people were very skeptical of him because if you don't know the background of Paul, Paul used to be a persecutor of Christians. He used to take Christians out of their homes, beat them, and imprison them. He was there when Stephen was killed by people that hate Christians, and he endorsed it and condoned it. Paul was an awful, awful man, and then God saved him and changed his heart. And he wrote half the New Testament. He traveled throughout telling people of Jesus because he realized Jesus was the only way to the Father in heaven. So now we have Paul proclaiming the truth. And who was it that got everyone's attention and said, you need to listen to this man. This man has been genuinely changed by the power of God. It was Barnabas. Paul had a a listening audience many places because Barnabas had stood for the gospel of Jesus Christ. It was in chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, when Paul went up to Jerusalem to defend the gospel. It was Barnabas that went with him and said, yes, Gentiles are being saved and they do not have to become Jews in order to be made right with God. It's through faith in Jesus Christ alone. It was Barnabas that was with him. And now the text teaches that even Barnabas has been led astray and compromised. And so you can see how Paul is having great difficulty getting his message to the Galatian churches because even Peter, even Barnabas are compromising and adding to the gospel. And Paul is saying, no, 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 the true gospel is faith in Jesus Christ. And the Galatian churches are confused because there have been some that have crept into the church the various churches there teaching this addition to the gospel. Number two, compromising the gospel demands rebuke. Verse 14, but when I saw that they were straight, not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in the presence of all, if you being a Jew live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like the Jews? What's Paul mean there? Peter, you've been eating the diet the Gentiles eat. You've been eating foods Jews aren't supposed to eat, but you've set that aside because God has declared all foods clean now. And yet these Jews come in and say, no, you're not supposed to be eating those things. And you start agreeing with them and you know good and well that you can eat whatever you wish. He's been living like a Gentile. And now he's demanding that Gentiles live like Jews. He's a hypocrite. Let me take you to the Jerusalem Council recorded in Acts 15. Stay with me here. Acts 15, verses 7 through 9. Brethren, you know that, here's Peter's words. Brethren, you know that in the early days, God made a choice among you that by my mouth, the Gentiles would hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, testified to them, giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he also did to us. What's Peter saying? God has given the Holy Spirit to the Gentiles that have believed, just as he's given the Holy Spirit to the Jew that has believed. Verse 9, Peter goes on to say, And he, the Lord, made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. Peter had testified that everyone is saved the same way, yet now he's adding to the gospel. What is that teaching us? It is warning you and I to be steadfast when it comes to the gospel. Why does that matter? Because we live in a world that says, yes, believe in Jesus and. We live in a world that says, yes, Jesus is great. I'll try him out, but I'm also going to do this. Hindus believe in Jesus. They add Jesus to their 300,000 other gods. They're not offended at all to do that. We live in a confusing world, and we must be proclaiming that the gospel of Jesus is the only way to be right with God. It is the way, the truth, and the life. There is no distinction between Jew or Gentile. Now, if you're sitting out there, who are these Jews and Gentiles? Jews are people born of the 12 tribes of Israel. They're God's chosen people by birth, by blood. Everyone else is a Gentile. If you are not aware that you're a Jew, you're one of the Gentiles. Okay, I am a Gentile. 
And so this is a debate over whether I am saved through faith in Jesus alone and you are saved by faith in Jesus alone or do you have to be saved by faith in Jesus and other stuff? Today, no one got saved because they were baptized. They're already saved because they placed their faith in Jesus. Today, they testified of it by being baptized. Peter was not causing unity by trying to be at peace with the party of circumcision and be at peace with the Gentiles. He was causing disunity. He was causing confusion. He were taking people that God had saved and placing them in bondage by requiring more than the gospel of them. Number three, one is justified by faith in Christ. About six years ago, maybe seven, I, I took a mission trip to Nepal. And in Nepal, it has the most famous Hindu temple in the world there in Kathmandu, Nepal. And so one of the touring sites on our half a day today of not doing ministry but touring a little bit, we went and walked the grounds of this Hindu temple. And at the grounds of this Hindu temple is the key river in all the world for Hindus. And really, it's a creek. I was amazed at how small it was and how slow and stagnant the water was flowing. There's a major day in the religion of Hinduism where Hindus from all over the world travel there and they submerge themselves, submerge themselves under the water thinking that that water of that river cleanses them and makes them right with God. And so I watched some Hindus getting in the water and making sure they covered themselves with it. It wasn't that special day, but still they were in the right river or creek. I must tell you, the creek was nasty. You would think it would be clean, pure water. It was just the opposite. It was filled with clutter and trash. It was dark. It was nasty. But you'll get in it if you believe it makes you right with God. Y'all with me? People all over the world are seeking to be right with God. Those Hindus don't even know of Jesus Christ. They just believe that God is there and they're trying their best to, to know him and they don't because Jesus is the way. Their way is not right. But they're trying to be justified in the sight of God. And that's true here. It's true in our community. People are trying to be justified in God's sight. They're trying to be right with God. Some are trying, are doing it through good works. Some are trying to do it by being great family people. Some are trying to do it by, by teaching others a trade or a craft or a subject. Others are trying to do it in various uh, assortment of ways, but they're trying to find their worth and to be right with God through their effort. And you can never be right with God by your effort. You're a sinner in need of the Savior. The only way to be right with God is to be justified by Jesus Christ. In verses 15 and 16, Paul reveals how you can be made right with God. It says, we are Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, since by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. Now, specifically, what is the law referring to? Well, the Jews know the Old Testament law quite well, typically. And the Old Testament law is the first five books of the Bible, but the core of that law is the Ten Commandments. And so these, these Jews were trying to add the law to God's grace. And they were saying, hey, we, try to, we believe we can be right with God by obeying the law. 
And you can never be right with God by obeying the law because there's no one that's obeyed the law perfectly except Jesus himself. The fifth commandment says, honor your father and mother. Have you always honored your father and mother? Uh, Honest, honest. Thank you. And for anyone else in the room that thinks you have, let me have your parents' number. All right? You've come in after curfew, or you've talked back, or you haven't done the the chore they asked you to do at that time, and you procrastinated because you were playing a video game or something. You have dishonored your parents in some form. Some in a major way, some you might consider a minor way, but you've dishonored your parents in some form or fashion, as have I. The seventh commandment says you shall not commit adultery, but in, in the New Testament, Jesus goes on to say if you've ever had lust in your heart for another, then you have committed adultery of the heart. If you've ever lusted, then God sees you as an adulterer. That's, that's the law standard. One of the commandments is you shall not murder, the sixth one. But Jesus goes on to say if you have hatred toward another, an impure hatred in your heart, you've committed murder of the heart. You don't have to commit the physical act of murder to be a murderer in God's sight. That is the standard of the law. The 10th commandment says you shall not covet. Coveting another neighbor, what they have, their wife, their home, their car, their money, whatever it is, that's coveting and that's sin. The eighth commandment, you shall not steal. You say, oh, I haven't, I haven't broken that one. Really? Maybe not, but I doubt it. Because all you have to do is go in the nursery today and you'll see a kid take a toy from another. You say, well, that's, that kid's so young, that doesn't count. Last time I checked, selfishness and stealing counts. We are lying, murdering, adulterating thieves that dis, have dishonored our parents. That's who you are, that's who I am. And therefore, we need the one that's none of those things to save us. And that's why Jesus came. And that's why Paul is saying to Peter, hey, buddy, we tried to keep the law, but no one can be justified by the works of the law. You and I, Peter, Paul's saying, we we are Jews, but we weren't saved by the law. We've been saved by faith in Jesus, just like a Gentile would be. Romans 3.20 says, through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Why did God give us the law? Why did he give us the Ten Commandments? It wasn't to save us. It was to show us our need to be saved. You might say, hey, I'm so good. You don't know all the good I've done. Well, again, you're a lying, murdering, adulterating thief. I don't think your good makes up for that. But you might say, hey, I'm too sinful to be saved. I know how bad I am. Well, no one's outside the reach of God's grace either. See, the commandments let you know of your guilt. But Galatians 3, 24, and I can't wait to get to chapter 3, but it says, therefore the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith, faith in the Jesus that died and rose from the dead. So, The law lets us know we're guilty. Jesus is the answer. He's the cure. Will you place your faith in Jesus and be saved forevermore? Notice verse 16. He says, we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we may be justified by faith and not by works of the law. What does the word justified mean? All right, if if you're tired, just do this right here. All right. Just to let you know, we, we are way past halfway. <laughs> All right. What's the word justified means? We, we need to understand that word because it's here. We're not justified by works of the law, but by faith. So what does it mean? Justification is when God declares you right with him, even though you're guilty. 
You're in a court of law and you are guilty, but the judge says, I declare you righteous. Now, please hear me. Some have said justification and being justified is just as if I have not sinned. Um, I'm not going to be brutal against that statement, but I don't think it really gives the right picture. Because it is that you have sinned. It's not as if you haven't. Then you feel good about yourself. No, you have. But he says, I'm not going to hold it against you. I declare you justified. I declare you right. It's not that you are. It's that he declares you to be. It's not that he, he says, hey, it's not as if you haven't committed these sins. No, you have. You have. So don't feel good about yourself. Feel good about what I'm doing for you. I'm declaring you right with me in spite of what you've done. Because you have placed your faith in me. You have trusted in me. I declare you justified. Woo! And so God gets the attention. God gets the glory. He's the one who justifies. It says in Romans 8, God is the one who justifies. You can't justify yourself. I can't declare you right with him. He is the only one that can do that. And notice in Romans 5, 1, it says, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Being declared right with God brings peace to your life. You receive the peace of God. Have you been wrestling? Trust in Jesus and receive his peace. Justification is not a process. You either are justified or you are not. There is no partial justification. It's not something that lasts over time. It's an action God takes on your behalf when you place your faith in him. Look with me in verse 17 and 18. But if while seeking to be justified in Christ, we ourselves having also been found sinners, is Christ then a minister of sin? May it never be exclamation mark. For if I rebuild what I once destroyed, I prove myself to be a transgressor. Paul is arguing the inconsistency of Peter's compromise, of his hypocrisy. He had declared that people are right with God and justified by faith in Christ alone. Now he adds the law as requirements for salvation. And if that were accurate, Paul says, you and I wouldn't be saved, Peter. For we have sinned since we've been justified. Now here's a key doctrinal understanding we need to have. Being justified speaks of your position in Jesus. Sanctification speaks of your process of maturity in Jesus. After someone is justified, do they still need to confess their sins? Yes. It's not to be saved. You don't confess to be saved. You already are. It's not to remain saved as if you could lose it. But it is to be in right fellowship with God. And that's what it speaks of in 1 John Chapter 1, beginning in verse 8, it says, If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. Now, right there, John is writing to Christians. And he says, if a Christian says, hey, I'm saved, I don't have any sin. What's he say? We deceive ourselves and that person doesn't have the truth of God in them. Verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned, I'm saved now, I have not sinned. If we say that, we make him, Christ, to be a liar and his word is not in us. So even after we are saved, though we hate sin, see when you're lost, you sin and you like it. When you're saved, in a general sense, in a very basic elementary sense, when you're saved, you might sin, but you don't like it. You don't want to do it. Your heart's broken over that. Okay? And so it leads you to confession. And so as a believer, you still commit sin. 
And you need to confess it to be in right fellowship with God. He doesn't want to hear all your petitions until you come before him and say, God, forgive me for my selfishness. Forgive me for my pride. Forgive me for not sharing the gospel with that person you just placed in front of me. God, forgive me for impatience. Whatever the sin is, he wants you to confess so you're in right standing. Not that you can lose your salvation from it. You don't lose your salvation. But I don't want to just be saved and forgiven and justified. I want to be pleasing to him day in and day out. That's why I confess I love him. He is my Lord. I want to be in right fellowship with him. That's sanctification. That's the process of growing in maturity as a Christian. Here in the text, Paul's emphasis is not on sanctification. It is on justification. We are not declared right by God due to works of the law, but by the gospel of Jesus Christ, by faith in him alone. That's the message Paul's emphasizing, is how one is saved, not the process as a Christian. I want to take you now in closing to one final text. I want you to take this in. John chapter 3 will be on the screen for you. John chapter 3, verse 16 and following. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Verse 17, for God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved from their sins, saved through him. Verse 18, he who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. What does the word believe mean? It is more than head knowledge. Because when you go to the book of James, you find out that the demons believe Jesus is God in the sense that they know who he is. They know him to be God. But they don't, they don't believe in the, in the sense that it means in John 3, 16. They, they know he's God, but they don't trust in him. They don't follow him. They don't submit to him. They don't surrender to him. And so the word believe means to trust in, surrender Two, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, Jesus, that whoever trusts in Jesus and not in self, whoever surrenders to Jesus and his authority over them and not in self, shall not perish and end up in hell, but shall everlasting life and end up in heaven. And he who does not believe, according to verse 18, it's not that one day you will be judged, you are judged already. Look, with, look at it with me, verse 18. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already. And so if you have not trusted in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it's not just that you're going to receive judgment in the future, which will happen, but you're under God's judgment now. But God, out of his love for you, sent forth his son so you don't have to remain in a state of judgment but that you, by faith in Christ, can be declared right with him. You can be forgiven, you can be saved, you can be declared innocent. You are guilty of sin, but he will declare you righteous. That's the love of God, and that's the grace of God. We didn't deserve for God the Father to send his son to rescue us from our sin, but he's done it. And now what are you going to do about it? Are you going to respond to the drawing of God the Spirit, drawing you unto salvation? Will you confess Jesus as your Lord? Will you believe by trusting in Jesus today? If you'll bow your heads and close your eyes, please. Right where you're sitting, right where you are, you can say, Jesus, I've been trying to earn my way. Jesus, I've been trying to to do it my way. Jesus, I surrender to you. I believe that you are the Son of God, that you died and paid the price for my sin on the cross. And I now trust you. I now confess you as my Lord. Oh, Jesus, 
justify me. Not because I deserve it, but because you are gracious. Save my soul. And on the authority of God's word, if you mean that with all of your heart, then God just saved you. And you've gone from darkness to light, from spiritual death to life, and you are no longer under the judgment of God. But you have received the free gift of eternal life. In just a moment, we're going to stand and begin to sing. And as we begin to sing, would you come share with the pastor that God has saved you today, that you have placed your faith in Jesus, that you believe. Let us celebrate with you. We won't embarrass you in front of everyone. Just share with the pastor. Let that pastor pray with you and encourage you. We want to celebrate that God has saved you. We want to counsel with you and encourage you as you begin your journey with Jesus. In just a moment when we stand, would you please make your way forward to a pastor? Don't be ashamed of Jesus who was not ashamed to go to the cross for you. In just a moment when we stand to sing, maybe the Lord is moving on your heart to become part of the church family. Would you come to a pastor and share that, that we may pray with you and encourage you and you receive counseling about and begin the membership process of officially becoming part of the family. Maybe the Lord's speaking to you about believers' baptism. You witnessed four of them today. And you say, I know that I have trusted in Jesus, but I need to be biblically baptized. Would you come and share that with one of the pastors? That we may encourage you and set up your time to be baptized in the days ahead. Maybe the Lord's convicted you that you're not sharing the gospel. May you come and make these steps your altar. Kneel at these steps and pray for the lost. Pray for boldness. Maybe the Lord's burdened you for a specific family member or friend or co-worker or neighbor or classmate. Maybe you want to come and get on your knees and pray for God to save their souls. May you respond as we begin to sing in just a moment. Holy Spirit, save the lost and lead them to surrender to you right now and let us know that we may celebrate with them. Move people to become part of the family. Move people to be faithful in believers' baptism. Move people to be courageous and not a hypocrite, but bold in sharing the gospel. This is our prayer, and we pray it all in your name, Jesus. Amen.